Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Joshua Ford is the author of the number one national bestseller, Moonwalking with Einstein, which has been translated into 37 languages. And he's co-author of Atlas Obscura, an explorer's guide to the world. Most relevant to our conversation today, he is the lay founder of Lair House, a Jewish tavern and house of learning, which is opening in Boston, Massachusetts. Foyer is co-founder and chairman of Safaria and co-creator of the international design competition, Sukkah City. His partner in crime is Rabbi Charlie Schwartz. He is the director of Lair House, a Jewish tavern and house of learning. He was formerly director, co-founder of Not A Box Media Lab, and most recently senior director of Jewish education at Hillel International. Welcome to the broadcast, Charlie and Josh. It's great to see you. It's great to be here. Thank you. So Lair House, this is the new best thing, I think. I'm, I'm already a convert. Uh, even though you, have, you haven't opened the doors or served a drink yet, am I right? Uh, yeah, it's a, little, it's a little early, but yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> we appreciate we start, the enthusiasm. Yes, we got the enthusiasm. So let's, let's just explain um, what I would say, I guess, on one foot, is that it's a Jewish tavern um, with hopefully great learning and connection, but I'm going to let you all do it better. Charlie, do you want to start? Because you're the director, correct? Yeah, yeah. The way we describe it is as the world's first Jewish tavern and house of learning. There's actually a long tradition of Jewish taverns and a long tradition of Batemi Drash, of houses of learning, but we're bringing them together in this in this space, in Lair House. Uh, it's a space where you can come and get an amazing cocktail, some great food with flavors from across the Jewish diaspora. And it's a place where you can sit and you can learn. You can learn with a chavruta, with a learning partner that you might already know. We can set you up with a partner and you can begin that process. Or you can take an amazing class from either one of our content partners or uh, from, from one of our staff members. So the idea is to bring together these ideas of what it means to to spend time together, to eat, to dwell together, uh, and to engage in, in real deep Jewish learning. Amazing. And before we go into sort of like how it actually will work, Josh, what was, why did you decide to uh, embark on this project when obviously you, you're juggling so many, as is Charlie, but why, why this idea now? Because I, I want it for myself and for my friends. And this is something that should exist in the world. And like, you know, when you, like most Jewish spaces are not spaces that uh, even I, as like a pretty Jewy Jew, like am excited to inhabit. And uh, we're excited to create a place that is warm and welcoming and like that one wants to spend time in being Jewish and doing Jewish things. And that's really at the heart of, of, of the enterprise. You know, one of the things when I was listening to an interview that you all uh, did a few weeks ago is you said this very basic thing, Josh, which is that like there aren't a lot of Jewish places <laughs> like, and, and it seems so fundamental because other than synagogue, I mean, JCC, it, the idea of togetherness and togetherness kind of over what the, the way we're, we're often so so at our happiest together is over food and drink, not necessarily in pews, not necessarily in class classroom settings at desks or however learning happens. So just the, the idea to sort of just refocus our minds on what's missing, if you can well, say a little yeah, more about that. Yeah, I mean, if you, if, if you think about what every Jewish community has in terms of building spaces, like, you know, every, every Jewish community has a synagogue, every Jewish community's got, uh, at least in the big cities, a JCC, you've got Jewish delis, you've got, I suppose, mikvahs, you've got, um, what's, what's missing is a place where Jews can gather to, First of all, commune as Jews, just socially gather as Jews, but something else, which is just as fundamental, which is to engage with Jewish text to learn, um, which has historically been like a very, very central Jewish activity. And when you when you say that, that is kind of shocking that there is not a space for learning that is like open and accessible and that everybody feels comfortable walking into in every Jewish community across the U.S. and across the world. Mm. So, Charlie, how would this work? Like somebody walks into a bar, Jew walks into a bar. I know that joke's been made, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it too. It's JBS. It's new for JBS. A Jew walks into a bar, walks into Lair House. Like, what is it just like uh, ordering a drink and where's my study partner? 
Yeah. So first of all, you could walk in just for the food and drinks. We're really putting together uh, a top level uh, food and beverage program. Uh, we're working with really one of the best, best bartenders in the Boston area, a woman named Naomi Levy, who's, uh, who's quite accomplished and like is, is pulling together these amazing drinks from, from uh, really flavors across, from across the Jewish world and really like a, like a top level food program too. Um, we have like Noah Clickstein as our executive chef, who's, uh, who uh, has an amazing pedigree, Michael Leviton, who's a seven-time James Beard Award nominee as, as our uh, consulting chef. So first of all, you could show up, you could just have food and drink and like, <laughs> comma, the stories like within the food and drink that we're serving is going to be a learning experience. You can learn about Jewish history and different Jewish peoples and places in the Jewish world that you might not, not have known about before. So like, you could just do that. And <laughs> there's a whole learning uh, side of it as well. So you'll be greeted by one of our learning guides who's someone that you could actually schedule time with to be uh, like to begin that process. There'll be a calendar of events of classes going on that you could uh, you could you could sign up for. You could show up one night. Um, and there's just going to be like amazing texts and books and source sheets all around in ways that are exciting and accessible. So that could be your honor. We talk about ways of making Jewish learning, Jewish texts approachable and accessible, but not overwhelming and not too demanding. And so like there'll be kind of moments of surprise and delight throughout, whether it's like a little text that comes uh, at your table or just like interesting, you know, books ranging from Talmud to, to fiction, to philosophy, to poetry, like that line the walls that you can peruse to cookbooks, to graphic novels. Um, so really like making text accessible and approachable, both like in a can formal learning. Can you just give maybe yeah. one example of just how like a cocktail might link you to diaspora life or history, or is there, is there something that can kind of concretize how the learning yeah, comes so, out yeah. of the eating? Yeah. So I'll give, I can give a few. So, so a few of the cocktails that Naomi is, is working on is one is like a Hawaii espresso martini. So taking the espresso martini, a very popular drink right now, and adding Hawaii, just kind of warming spice. Uh, it's very common in the Yemenite Jewish kitchen kitchen and adding to it. So the flavor profile then becomes one that's a reminiscent of, of a very Jewish flavor. Another one is uh, there's, there's a, there's a breakfast drink that's, that's common in the Sephardic world called pepitadas. And it's, it's roasted melon seeds that have then been kind of made into a milk. Uh, and it's the first thing that a lot of Sephardic communities will drink after a breakfast is that kind of that first hydrating moment. So she has a wonderful cocktail of Applejack, Pepitatis, and just like a little hint of Arak, of that like strong oh, anise liquor. And so that, that like takes you to this whole, like this whole world and history of, of Sephardic Jewry in this like this really delightful way. Uh, Josh, I want to just touch on the history of Lair House because it obviously informs this new iteration. And, and many people don't remember that Franz Rosenzweig had a dream, a vision, and sadly, it was kind of cut short. But can you just give us kind of a little bit of that story? Yeah, so this is uh, sort of inspired by the original Lair House, which uh, existed in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, opened in 1920. And it was put together by Franz Rosenzweig, who is this fascinating uh, philosopher, theologian, sort of interesting Jew at the intersection of a lot of interesting ideas. And uh, he conceived of the Lair House as a space where Judaism could be reinvented from the outside in. And he was inviting uh, leading scholars and intellectuals, secular and religious, to come together and talk about Jewish ideas. And out of that space came a lot of the most important Jewish ideas of the 20th century. Of course, the Lair House in Frankfurt was short-lived, um, but it's that spirit which is animating or being reanimated in the space that we're opening here in Boston. And, and I don't think it's insignificant that Rosenzweig was on the verge of conversion to out of Jew. I mean, not he was going to become a Christian and decided not to. And instead sort of doubles down on a different kind of I guess, Jewish orientation or prioritization. Can you just talk about what he was envisioning based on what he saw as kind of like deficient? Because it, it seems like it's informing what you, you're, what you all are building in this it's an exciting way. That it's, it's not so stayed, fixed um, in a way, not academic. I'm, 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 these are obviously pejorative words. I don't mean to be so pejorative because there's plenty that exists that's amazing and, and magical. But it, it kind of speaks to what a lot of people feel right now, where they sort of feel stuck or uninspired. Yeah, I mean, he he really believed, Rosenzweig really believed that well, like one of the central things that was missing from the Jewish community of his time was, was Jewish learning. 
was an engagement with Jewish ideas an engagement with Jewish texts and, and thinking about ways that those texts and ideas can animate our lives today or, or the lives back then. And I, and I would say like through, through today, and he actually pushed back on the academic approach to the study of Jewish text. And he was more of like through, he was more focused on, on a lived approach of what, how do these, how do, can I understand these texts today and how might they impact me in, in what I do today? So one of his kind of main kind of pedagogic modes was going from the outside in was was taking people who were not academic experts in the study of Judaism and having them having them teach on big Jewish ideas, uh, bringing their expertise to bear. The idea being that like sometimes someone from an outside perspective with outside expertise can can enlighten like the the conversation of Judaism. And it's like less important of placing it in its like immediate historical context as like an academic might, and more about like. What does it mean that we can derive from it right now? I just want to mention a few of the of the of the teachers of his time: Eric Fromm, Martin Buber, Leo Strauss, Mark Chagall. Is that something? Um, obviously, not not a woman there. I don't think. Oh, Bertha, Bertha Poppenheim is there. Yay! But for you guys, is that is that also a model? Is the idea that we're not just having rabbis and scholars? Totally, and like part of what we are trying to say to the wider Jewish world is like. Jewish text, Jewish learning, like this is not just for like an Orthodox elite. This is for everybody and um, has value for everybody. And, you know, I think there are a lot of Jews out there who um, American Jews who say like, ah, I don't really like going to synagogue. Like, that's not really for me. I'm not like, I don't know what I believe about God. Like, that's not really what attracts me to Judaism. But, like, I love Jewish ideas and I love like engaging with Jewish thought. And um, I love the intellectual tradition of Judaism and the tradition of curiosity. And there is a, we're trying to create a kind of um, home base, a headquarters for people who like get excited and animated by that vision of Judaism, uh, not at the expense of other visions of Judaism, but like creating a kind of home for, for that. And I think, I think there are a lot of, a lot of folks out there who, can be can be excited by by Jewish text and by like serious engagement with this incredible tradition. Well, I will say that just personally, that was sort of my road back to Jewish engagement was studying text and talking um, in Hevruta in partnership. But it's sometimes a hard sell. And I know one of your partners is the Shalom Hartman Institute, um, and I've certainly drunk the Kool Aid on Hartman because Hartman Learning because it makes me suddenly see its relevance in my life in ways I didn't expect. It sort of surprises you how it begins to animate lived, lived life, not just lived Judaism. Um, but it's, there's, there's a barrier to many people and I'm not even giving myself a, a trophy for it. There was a barrier for me for a long time of, you know, how, how should I, why should I prioritize this? And also am I kind of smart enough, uh, you know, fluid enough in Jewish text, in Jewish learning, maybe in Hebrew to even, begin. Like it sometimes feels like if that ship has sailed, it's too late for, for me to do that. And and now you're even assuming that that, that bar, the bar and the bar, <laughs> will will be low enough that people are going to walk into the bar. So how do you how are you approach people's hesitancy? Yeah. So I I mean I'd say two things. Like one, like really figuring out like those those on ramps really well and making sure that they're relational, like that it's about the like, connection with between two people and like and mitig, you know, learning look, looking learning at texts you know, through, uh, through a relationship lens, that's one. And then like, like two, and like, this is a hypothesis, this is a hypothesis because we're not open yet, but like the fact that it's a bar actually does make it more accessible, right? Like if you wanted, you know, thinking back on, on your narrative, like how did you get, you know, what was your first on road into Jewish learning or Jewish text or back into Jewish learning or Jewish text? Like right now, if someone came to me and said, you know, I'm interested in Jewish learning, where should I go? I would say like, I would direct them towards synagogue, some organized Jewish community, maybe a JCC, not always the most accessible places. Mm -hmm. We're building like a storefront space that, that people will enter and understand like, this is a place where I can sit and order food. That is also a place where they can sit and learn texts. So there's something about like that, the physicality of it, uh, that like the public space nature and the public square nature that like will actually make those texts more accessible or that experience more accessible. Josh, do you want to say more about that? Or well, that I'd say the other, the other, uh, thing that we are really trying to evangelize out of Lairhouse is what you mentioned, which is the power of Hebruta, of paired learning. And we often say, like, you know, we think this is the best idea that has yet to, Jewish idea that has yet to escape the orbit of orthodoxy. 
um, like very, very few American Jews even know the word chavruta, much less have a practice of chavruta. Mm -hmm. And here's a way of being deeply, authentically Jewish in relation with another person, interpersonally, like developing a deep friendship mitigated by or mediated by um, text in the Jewish tradition. And I've seen the power of this in my own life. Like it is hard to have deep, meaningful like relationships with other people and talk about real deep ideas and, and, and what ends up happening inevitably. And this is part of the genius of, 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 of the tradition. Like the text becomes a kind of Rorschach block that like provokes conversations around uh, other, you know, whatever is actually needs to be discussed. And I think it's a, we, we got a great, a, a great product that just needs a little bit of marketing. And I think that's part of what Lairhouse is set up to do. And you also talked, Josh, in one interview about just the reality of loneliness right now. And it's pervasive. And sometimes it's not necessarily what someone's talking about, but we know it's what so many people are feeling. Um, is that, you know, it's clearly answered by a social um, kind of space. But, but what I love about the learning part of it is that you're not just showing up and sitting on a bar stool. There is kind of something you've come to do. And, is that, and how, how are you thinking about sort of just answering that appetite or need. Yeah, I mean, so uh, just th just this week, the Times had a, a story about the um, the friendship de friendship deficit of, of middle-aged men. And like, I get it, right? It's hard to make friends, it's hard to make deep friendships. And that's really part of the promise here is like, here's a way, like being Jewish, you can be Jewish alone, you can be Jewish, you can be, you can be Jewish with a friend. So come with a friend, who you want to become like deep in your relationship with. And we'll show you this ancient technology for doing that. So the two of you, Charlie, how did you guys uh, talk about Chavruta, become Chavruta on this project? Have you known each other forever? Are you best friends? Uh, what's, uh, what's the we, backstory? Uh, we, were, we were in a co-working space together and then we became friends that way. And then we started like physically working out together. As you can, you can tell we're, you know, very strong gentleman. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you're, you're very fit Jews. And then, uh, and then it turns out um, uh, Josh is a, is a woodworker and I needed a new kitchen table. So then, uh, wow. so then a dining room table. So then we, um, we started on the process of, of making a table together. And in that process of making the table, uh, I think Josh, my son's Josh is that you've been noodling on this idea for a while. So he kind of floated the idea and then it went back and forth and then the pandemic hit. And that's, I think when it, uh, during the pandemic is when it became like a really good idea. Um, you know, this idea of like when everyone's isolating, starting to think about when we emerge from that isolation, what are the social needs of the community going to be? What's that public space going to look like? And how can we make sure that the Jewish community is there in, in exciting and meaningful ways? And Charlie, I will just let you kind of abandon humility for a moment because you're, you know, one of, one of the star leaders of the Jewish world, but you've left a very solid kind of career for something pretty risky. How, how do you think about that? Just as, you know, for, for those people who are thinking right now about much more DIY Judaism and kind of a little bit of disruption, good disruption, was it a, a, a tough choice? Uh, yeah, I mean, like risk is always hard, right? It's, it's always hard to leave something that's sure for something that's, that's totally unknown. Um, but we also have like a limited amount of time on this earth, right? And we have a limited time to like, to be with the ones that we want to spend time with. And I've found thus far, and I'm hoping it continues that this, this venture, although like very, very risky is enabling me to spend time, more time doing the work that, that I love and spending time with people that I'm incredibly inspired by and hopefully give me the opportunity to inspire more people. And Josh, you come from an undeniably famous Jewish family. I'm sure everyone is constantly asking you about your brothers and your brothers about you. But there's a there's kind of a hip factor. Like if it's good enough with Forge, maybe I should check it out. Like, do, are you aware that if you put kind of your hatcher on something, people are going to come? And is there a pressure in that? Uh, I I have never. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> thought that anybody regarded me as cool. Um, but I, so I'm flattered. Uh, I look, I, I hope that we're able to attract like really interesting people to this space and to this project. And that one of the things that's been super interesting about just like getting this off the ground is discovering how many notable Jewish 
people in the world uh, like have learning practices of some kind. You're like, oh, really? You do this already? Like you learn with somebody? That's a, like, who would have guessed? And I think when we start to show people how accessible this actually is and how many people that you wouldn't expect um, have like somebody that they learn with once a week for 45 minutes um, that American Jewry will start to be able to imagine that like, oh, this is something that I could do. And this is something that I want to do. And that's part of what we want to showcase here. Um, so we're going to be bringing interesting people into the space and like actually having learning happen publicly um, with interesting people to show just how like exciting this can be. And I know that you both don't want to in any way denigrate what has come before, but there is, I think I've, I've heard you both talk about, it and I agree, sometimes a dumbing down that happens in Jewish learning, um, that there's sort of a sense that to make something accessible and popular is to kind of take the lowest common denominator of complexity. And I certainly, you know, find that that's deadening and it actually has the opposite effect. Um, and, and even for the youngest people that they sort of smell pediatric Judaism. So what, how, how are you approaching something that is both accessible and also kind of demanding? Like we're, first of all, we're, we're putting Jewish learning like at the, the front of this, like this is, that's, you know, this is like a, a, a Jewish forward uh, venture. Um, in terms of, in terms of the dumbing down, like first is like thinking hard about who's in the space and who's teaching in the space. Um, and the, you know, we're, we're partnering with, um, with, uh, with Hartman and Hadar and Hebrew college. And these are all institutions that have uh, really, they really have like a strong brand around uh, like content intensive learning. Um, so the first is like, who, who, who's actually going to be teaching in this space. And the second is, is just like, is I would say like just the broader value proposition of what, of what we're doing is like, this is a space that's like really geared, you know, as Josh likes to say is like around Jewish excellence um, and focusing on, on, on pushing that forward. Um, I would say like, there is like a design note that we're, we're working on that I think, I think plays into this and that we're also trying to make this a not kitschy space. Um, a lot of the, oftentimes, although not always the default for, um, for Jewish spaces or Jewish spaces that are kind of, you know, trying to do something new or interesting is, is to lean into kitsch. Um, and we're trying to, we're really trying to create a space that's, that's deep and engaging and fun and playful and joyful, but, but not kitschy. And I think like sometimes that, that pediatric Judaism kind of gets, gets, uh, combined with kitsch because it, it can be a default. So staying away from that and really thinking hard about, um, how to fill a space with meaning and joy and friendship and connection. Um, and again, playfulness, but, but not kitsch. I think that's, that's another kind of key element. And Josh, at one point you said food is text. Um, I think a lot of Jews would agree with that, but I want to make sure we know what you mean by that. Cause I know that real excellence when it comes to what is going to be served and available here is also part of vision. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's Charlie's line, but I'm happy to borrow oh, okay. it. I think it's well, a good you stole one. It. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so everything that is in this space is like an opportunity to, to peel back and to open up and to, um, and to make connections. And the, the menu that's come together here is like a globetrotting, uh, like, uh, taster course around the Jewish world. And I think one of the things that my, like my generation of Jews, like, I feel like the, the first generation really appreciate like, how global um, Judaism is and that, like, we have, uh, you know, uh, there's Jewish cuisine that comes from Tunisia and Jewish cuisine that comes from Ethiopia and Jewish cuisine that comes from uh, from Galicia and Jewish cuisine that comes from the New World. And um, there's actually something that ties it all together. There's, like, I mean, there's a, a wonderful rabbi in in in. Jerusalem that we've been in Chavruta with about this project. He's a, he's a chef and he talks about how, like, you know, what's the terroir of French cuisine? Well, it comes from like the French land, like Italian cuisine comes from the Italian land. Where does Jewish cuisine come from? It comes really like from time and mm -hmm. a relationship with time. And there's, uh, you know, just as like Eastern European Jews have uh, a dish that, goes into the oven on Friday afternoon and comes out uh, midday Saturday warm. Like, so do Moroccan Jews. So do Yemeni Jews. And um, 
like as, as different as these cuisines are, they all share something in common. And one of the things that we're trying to do with this menu is expose, um, expose people to, to the full breadth of, of, of Judaism. Great. So finally, Charlie, I know you have aspirations, if this really does fly, for it to be in other places. Is that, are you able to talk about what those dreams are, what, how you would like this to be replicated? Uh, we, we have to open our doors in Boston first, <laughs> but, uh, if it's, if we're successful here in, in the Boston area, like we, we really do believe that this is, this is a model that could be replicated in, in all sorts of other places. Uh, so we've like no, no specific plans of what, where our house two goes, but we're building it right now, um, with the expectation that, that there will be a, a second and third and fourth and fifth Lair house, uh, you know, at some point in the future. And for those who want to know more about it, where do they go? Um, they can go, we have a, we have a, a very early website, lair.house.house, L-E-H-R dot H-A-U-S. And you can sign up there uh, for our newsletter. So to get updates about when, uh, what's going on as the renovations come to a close and as we kind of move towards opening. Great. And Josh, I'm going to give you the final word just on what success would look like. Like, what do you just say, this is what's going to make you feel like this worked? Well, I think uh if we have created a space that is warm and inviting that is filled with torah that people actually want to spend time in that will be a win uh if we can do that and create a model that can be replicated in other communities that would be a tremendous win and that's really what we're aiming for thank you both for being part of this charlie schwartz and joshua foyer cheers to lair house it's going to be the new the new cheers. And I look forward to checking it out and having one of those cocktails. I'm Abigail Pogrubin for In the Spotlight. It's so good to be with you all. And I look forward to seeing you next time.